They headed off to college. Beautiful girls with big plans and promising futures. Katie came to school there. I got her to pledge in my sorority. But suddenly, they ended up as tragic headlines, victims of unspeakable evil. We have a purse and we have a cell phone. We have a missing girl. Through exclusive interviews. They dug up a lot of the backyard, thinking that maybe I had buried her. And rare footage. She popped up and yeah, did my shit. Will reveal how college dreams became co-ed nightmares. Next. Lindsay Eklund wasn't the kind of girl to get mixed up in trouble, so it should have been no big deal for the Southern California co-ed to enjoy a little extracurricular fun. Lindsay and two of her girlfriends went to San Diego to meet up with some other women down there and go clubbing. But a night on the town led to a haunting mystery that would linger over Lindsay's small college town for a decade. Lindsay Eklund was raised by her single mother, Nancy, in Placentia, California, 30 minutes east of L.A. She was a happy child. She was smiling all the time. Her smile was gorgeous. But Lindsay's life was turned upside down at a very young age. When she was five years old, we were in a horrific auto accident. She wasn't expected to live. She was in the hospital for months and months and then years and years of therapy and hospitals and surgeries. Lindsay recovered, but the violent accident left her partially paralyzed on her left side. Nancy Eklund doted on her young daughter. It was just mainly her and I. She was the main focus of my life. After high school, Lindsay enrolled in nearby Fullerton College to study journalism. She planned to become a reporter I was very proud of her. She was trying to be more independent. I felt that she was probably trying to be more of herself rather than hooked to her mom. In the winter semester of her freshman year, Lindsay planned a Friday night outing with friends. I was at work. She called me and wanted to know if she could spend the night at Andrea's house. But Andrea didn't come get Lindsay. Instead, the co-ed caught a ride with a friend named Chris McCamus. He was a good-looking guy that was normal, and Lindsay wanted to go to Andrea's house, and he was the transportation, as far as I knew. Chris met Lindsay through friends, and they had sort of a casual relationship. There may have been some talk about some romantic interest between the two, but it was very minimal. Trusting Lindsay's judgment, Nancy said goodbye to her beloved 20-year-old daughter. I didn't question it at all. I just walked out with him, and that was it. We always hugged. And I says, remember your seatbelt. She says, back at you, Mom. I love you. And that was the last time I heard from her or saw her. Nancy was unaware that there were no plans for a sleepover that night. Instead, Chris and Lindsay picked up some friends and hit the highway. Chris said that he and Lindsay and two of her girlfriends went to San Diego to meet up with some other women down there and go clubbing. The next day, Lindsay was scheduled to tutor some neighborhood kids. She never showed up, and she wasn't answering her cell phone. I called every hospital that I knew of, and no one knew about her. Nancy contacted the police that following Monday to report Lindsay missing. Within days, Lindsay's disappearance became top news. Just say, Mom, I'm OK. And that's all I need. That's all anybody needs right now. Investigators zeroed in on the last known person to see Lindsay. They had me in for interrogation for quite some time. They, they searched my truck to see if they could find anything. They searched my house. Chris McCamus claimed to have dropped Lindsay off on a corner near her house, perhaps two houses down from where she actually lived. He said that she asked him to do this though, so that she wouldn't wake up her mother. He admitted that when he dropped her off on the corner that he made a U-turn in the street and then just left. A surveillance camera in the area seemed to corroborate Chris's story. There was an ATM video showing a white truck that drove by with only a driver, not a passenger. It looked like that might have been McCamus's truck. 
And that's why Placentia kind of moved away from him as a suspect. Wherever Lindsay is right now, um, if she's if she's alive and well, I'd want her to know to come home. If she's passed away, if someone has done something to her, I want that person to be in jail. After ruling out Chris McCamus, police turned their attention to another local man named Marty Pergenzer. Here is this 50-something-year-old guy who uh, all of a sudden appears on the scene and seems to have uh, a, a relatively close and ongoing somewhat long-standing relationship with Lindsay. Now, I'm concerned about this girl, okay, you know, and she's missing. We focused very hard on him, and I really thought that we were looking at the person that knew where Lindsay was, but as it turned out, we were wrong. After their interview, police cleared Pregenzer as a potential suspect. But soon, they locked in on a startling new person of interest, Lindsay's mother. So we, again, we have to do due diligence she was a complete stranger to us and you know many people can put on the face that they are a caring parent when actually they are responsible for a death or a disappearance they went through every room they dug into the ground they thought that i had buried her in the backyard you really have to keep your options open you don't want to wrongfully accuse anybody or exclude looking at somebody because it's uncomfortable the police search turned up nothing and Nancy was cleared. But the problem was, authorities were fresh out of ideas. As the months passed, the hope of finding Lindsay dwindled. At least a year or so into it, you've done everything that you can do. You've talked to everybody you can talk to, sometimes more than once, and there's just nothing more to be done. Nancy Eklund was living a mother's most terrifying nightmare. I remember sleeping by my phone. I literally sat on the floor in the living room by the phone in case I got a call. But the worst was yet to come. Coming up, the shocking truth revealed. He had, up until that point, for nine years, committed the perfect crime. And later, another co-ed is attacked in the middle of the night. He was able to get the knife from her and then proceeded to stab Mickey several times. Twenty-year-old Southern California college student Lindsay Eklund went missing in early 2001. Her disappearance ignited an investigation that made major headlines. We checked everything. We checked everybody. We checked everything. There was just no sign. It was just as if she vanished. After the case went cold, Lindsay's mother Nancy endured nearly 10 frustrating years, desperate to find the truth. Every year at the Orange County Fair has a, a month-long fair. I would stand at the front gate and pass out thousands of flyers. In 2010, cold case investigator Larry Montgomery was asked to review the evidence in the case with a fresh set of eyes. The Placentia police detectives told me that they had developed a couple of possible suspects, one being an older man that had befriended Lindsay. Another one was the man that dropped her off the night she disappeared. As previous detectives had done, Montgomery ruled out Marty Pergenzer as a suspect. Instead, he focused on the last person who claimed to see Lindsay alive, her friend, Chris McCamus. Larry noticed a problem with the surveillance photo that seemed to support Chris's story. I was curious to see if it was really his truck. So uh, uh, looking at the photograph, and I found actually three things that struck me as being odd. What he was able to do is take a closer look at that still frame and compare it to the exact model that this defendant had and see that there were some differences. So it wasn't the same truck. Montgomery also discovered that Chris had made a suspicious purchase the night Lindsay disappeared. I was looking for actually a usage of his credit card somewhere between San Diego and Corona, and I didn't find one, but I did find that his card was used that Saturday in Santa Clarita, which is 50 miles north 
of where Chris lives. McCamus worked for his father's construction company. At the time of Lindsay's disappearance, they were on a project in Santa Clarita. I was able to uh, locate the foreman, and uh, he was able to tell me that Chris was one of the tractor drivers that worked there during the entire time. So that meant that Chris had lied because he said he wasn't working at that time. In the decades since Lindsay's disappearance, Chris McCamus had gotten married, started a family, and seemed to put Lindsay's disappearance behind him. But Larry Montgomery strongly suspected that Chris murdered Lindsay. He arrested McCamus and brought him in for interrogation. He basically presented Chris with a mountain of evidence that was going to be very difficult for him to talk his way out of. You are under arrest. I think they told you that I'm there. And, uh, for the murder of Lindsay Eklund. Kind of a long time coming situation. After a grueling barrage of questions, the moment of truth. All right, what happened was, as I was gonna take her home, she was telling me, why don't I just sleep over your place? We went back to my place, we went to sleep. I went to my kitchen in my apartment and I drank a lot of vodka. She pretended to be asleep and I pulled her pants down and I was totally drunk and I tried to put my penis inside of her. McCamus went on to say that when Lindsay rejected him, things suddenly turned violent. I grabbed her, <sighs> threw her onto my bed and I got her into a headlock. <clears throat> okay and she died. He had, up until that point, for nine years, committed the perfect crime and had gotten away with it. At one point, he said, I always knew this day would come. You know, it feels better when you finally just say what you were supposed to say, you know? I know my life is ruined now. <laughs> McCamus led investigators to the spot in Santa Clarita where he had buried Lindsay's body. Parked my truck about right here. And then somewhere in this area here is where it's over in this vicinity. After recovering Lindsay's remains, detectives brought Nancy the tragic news. She looked at me and she said, all the way home. I was driving the car and I thought, maybe they found her. And maybe when I walk up the stairs and get to the top, Lindsay's gonna be standing there with them and she's coming home. And I said, I wish that I could tell you that, but I can't. I was just shocked. It was kind of a feeling I'd never heard before. And the detective says, do you want to know what happened to her? And I said, no. And then I started to cry. Like a minute maybe went by, and he says, yes, I need to know. And he says, she was strangled. In 2012, Lindsay's killer faced a judge for sentencing. Christopher McCamus was charged with one count of murder. He ended up pleading to one count of murder in the second degree and was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum parole eligibility of 15 years. McCamus was spared the death penalty but for Nancy Eklund, there would never be justice, only her memories of Lindsay. She had a smile that would just melt an iceberg. I, I was very proud of her. People say closure, I, don't, I hate that word. There's no, no such thing as closure. You never get over it, ever, ever. There's, there's not a day that goes by that I'm sitting at my desk and I, I, I feel the tears coming. Coming up, a heavy metal concert, thousands of fans, and a college co-ed disappears into the night. It was the worst day that I've ever spent.
It was supposed to be a girls' night out, a much anticipated study break for Virginia Tech student Morgan Harrington. She was more than thrilled about going to the Metallica concert. The show was a hit, but Morgan never saw it. If someone has Morgan, please go and come home safely. I knew something terrible bad had happened to Morgan. How could a pretty co-ed in a crowd of thousands simply disappear? Most of her life, Morgan Harrington was used to getting lots of attention. She was fun to be around, and people did notice her in a crowd um, because she was uh, free-spirited. Morgan was more bonded to me, and she leaned on me, and as she grew up as a teenager, I was the connection for her. And whenever she needed some support, I think she, she sought me out. When Morgan graduated high school, she was in no rush to sever the close bond with her doting family. In fact, leaving home to start freshman year at nearby Virginia Tech was a big step for Morgan. Maybe at, at a visceral level, she had such a hard time separating because she knew that going away to college was going to be the death of her. But Morgan seemed to adjust to college life. She even made time for a lifelong passion, music. Metallica was Morgan's favorite band, and when she found out the metal rockers were performing in the area, she was determined to be there. Dan had actually gone ahead and purchased the tickets for them that were pinned on my refrigerator for months prior to uh, the Metallica concert. She was just about to pop with excitement about it, planning the outfit, planning the transportation and everything. In October 2009, Morgan and three friends made the two-hour drive from Virginia Tech to an arena just outside the campus of the University of Virginia. I actually talked with her right as she was leaving and really not even thinking anything about danger or uh, something happening to Morgan. The friends found their seats and anxiously waited for showtime. They were watching the warm-up band and uh, at some point during that warm-up band, Morgan wanted to go to the restroom. Morgan then somehow ends up at the front of the building going out and then not able to come back in. It was about half an hour and the girls had not heard from Morgan. And we're getting worried because Metallica was coming on and where was their friend? And they called Morgan and Morgan answered her phone and said, I'm outside the arena. They will not let me re-enter and I'll find a ride home. The next morning, Morgan and I had planned at that point for her to stop back here on her way to tech so that we could balance her checkbook. Dan Harrington would never see his daughter again. The day after the concert, detectives made a disturbing discovery in a parking lot near the concert arena. We have a purse and we have a cell phone. We have a missing girl. Those are the facts. On Sunday morning, University of Virginia police received Morgan's purse that had been found by members of the men's lacrosse team, and it had been next to a fence. That was the worst day that I've ever spent. And just mad at the world. When the cell phone was found, for me, that was the moment of the great divide, the time that our life would never be the same. I knew something terrible bad had happened to Morgan. Dan and Jill Harrington wasted no time spreading the news about their missing daughter. Until this point, I have been saying that, that we're getting ragged, but I would say as of last night, we're kind of unraveling a bit. It was their energy and their desire to make sure that nobody in this country had not heard her name or seen her face as she was missing at that point, and they wanted her found. Please let Morgan go, no questions asked. Let her come home to us. The media in the community went sky high. Message boards were going up. We had vigils over at all the high schools. There were vigils at the house. Still, months passed without any solid leads. As winter arrived, the investigation went cold. The holidays came and went after Morgan disappeared, and we got a tremendous amount of snow that winter. Searches had been suspended because of it. Then, three months after Morgan disappeared, a farmer 10 miles outside Charlottesville stumbled upon what looked like animal remains. I was checking the fences and I thought I saw a dead deer and I stopped and it was a, a human skull. The remains were submitted for DNA testing. 
The Harrington family held their breath. They didn't tell us, obviously, very much. You know, I mean, at that point in time, it was like jumping off a cliff. That was really hard for me. Coming up, the group Metallica joins in the search effort. Any information, no matter how small you might think it is, could be that crucial piece investigators need to help solve the case. In the fall of 2009, 20-year-old Virginia Tech co-ed Morgan Harrington disappeared outside a Metallica concert. Despite constant media attention, there were no real clues. Until January 2010, when a Virginia farmer placed an urgent call to police. He was riding his tractor through this section of the farm, through the field, and he saw what he thought was a deer carcass. He saw bones, and as he got closer, he realized that he was looking at human remains. Morgan's father, Dan Harrington, learned of the discovery when a reporter from a local news channel called him at work. That was a very emotional day. I remember uh, driving to Charlottesville and tears running down. The medical examiner confirmed the family's fears, but due to decomposition, the time and cause of Morgan's death could not be determined, and there were no suspects. Typically, predators kill in, in the land they know, in an area they know, and they, um, leave their victims where they know, where they feel comfortable. Then, in July 2010, police announced they had recovered the T-shirt Morgan was wearing the night of her disappearance. DNA was recovered in this case that matched a separate case from 2005 in Fairfax, Virginia, which is a city about two to two and a half hours north of Charlottesville. So with this DNA match in Morgan's case, suddenly they had at least a composite sketch to release to the public. Metallica lead singer James Hetfield offered his personal support to help bring Morgan's killer to justice. If you've seen the person in this sketch or have any information about this case or any others, please contact your local police. Right now, there's up to $150,000 reward. Despite Metallica's high profile assistance, Morgan's killer has not been found. But Dan and Jill Harrington haven't given up hope. They've started a nonprofit group to stop campus crimes against women. We've started Help Save the Next Girl, which really grew out of trying to raise awareness and create more personal responsibility on college campuses. She wanted to go into early childhood education. We built a school in Zambia, Africa to honor Morgan. Morgan will be part of the education of more children than she would have actually been able to teach had she lived. It's a nice legacy. On May 19, 2012, a 33-year-old oil rig mechanic staggered into a New Orleans area emergency room. He has cuts all over him. Hours earlier and 135 miles away, Lafayette College student Mickey Shunick was riding her bike home from a friend's house. It was the longest route, but it would have been the, the, the most lit and safest route for her to get home. But Mickey never made it home. Soon, a desperate search for the beautiful co-ed would uncover a blood-soaked connection to the mysterious man in the ER. Bro, you know, that's, that's I have nothing to do with that girl's freaking disappearance. Michaela, better known as Mickey Shunick, grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana, the middle of three children. Sassy. That's one word that everybody uses to describe her. She stood out in a crowd that bright, you know, platinum blonde hair, and every once in a while you'd have a blue streak or a purple streak. An anthropology major at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette, Mickey was used to riding her bike around town. When traffic gets bad here, two wheels get you around faster than four wheels, and Mickey just loved to bike. Late one Friday in May, after a night out with friends, Mickey rode her bike home, down the empty streets of Lafayette. She knew these roads like the back of her hand. She knew that that night, there might be drunk drivers on the road, so she decided to take a different 
route home. The next day, Mickey was supposed to attend her younger brother's high school graduation, but she never showed up. Mickey would never have missed her brother's graduation. That's one of the reasons why her family knew very early on that something was wrong. After reporting Mickey missing, the Shunick family appealed to the media for help. Mickey's sister, Charlie, led the charge. Just please bring her back. Don't hurt her. And, um, just bring her back to us. We'll do anything you want. Within about two and a half days of her disappearance, we had uh, tweets being retweeted across the world. By day four, we had had the story on national news. If someone took her and she was conscious, they're hurting, they have broken ribs, they have a broken arm, broken nose, look for someone who's beat up around the office, around your neighborhood, because they might be responsible for this. A week after her disappearance, detectives recovered local security footage of Mickey on her bike. What we do know is that Mickey left her friend's residence and drove down a few downtown area streets until she crossed University Avenue in St. Landry. A little bit further down the road is the last time that we caught her on video. The surveillance video also revealed a white pickup truck that appeared to be following Mickey. Detectives were convinced the person in the truck was somehow involved in the case. Reporters ran with the story. Everybody was suspicious of anybody with a Z71 white pickup truck. There were thousands upon thousands of tips. Police followed up on a lead about a man named Brandon Laverne who was treated for multiple stab wounds at a New Orleans hospital the day Mickey disappeared. Laverne had been on law enforcement's radar for many years. He had recently completed a prison stint. He was a sex offender. Laverne also filed an insurance claim, reporting that his white pickup had recently been stolen and burned. Coupled with the tip about Laverne owning a white Z71 pickup truck, police began to narrow their focus on him. On July 5th, 2012, police pulled Laverne over and arrested him on a charge relating to a prior offense. We had obtained a warrant for Laverne's arrest regarding the altering of the driver's license by whiting out, removing the sex offender tag on it. When I actually finally got a, a chance to sit down in front of him, I was confident that we had the right man. I'm just getting back from work, you know, if whatever, whatever uh, warrants I got, man, you know what, I want to go ahead and bond out on, brother, you know, because, like I said, I ain't been home in two weeks. Authorities grilled Laverne about his stab wounds. The suspect claimed he was mugged. Where did you get stabbed at? Huh? Where did you get stabbed at? I got stabbed all over, man. I got stabbed in my hand. My... Yeah. You mind if I take a look? Once he was pressed about the information that we had and that we believed he was involved in her disappearance, he requested an attorney. No, I mean, you know, if, if you're saying all that, do I'm open no, bro. I want an attorney. Coming up, the shocking details behind Mickey's disappearance finally unfold. My opinion of what Mickey did that night was that she was an absolute warrior. In the spring of 2012, University of Louisiana student Mickey Shunick disappeared while riding her bike home late one night. After weeks of combing the area, there was no sign of the pretty blonde co-ed until police arrested convicted sex offender Brandon Laverne. Laverne was no stranger to crime and being in trouble with the law. He was in prison from 2000 to 2008 for sexually assaulting somebody. Laverne was also the main suspect in the strangling death of 35-year-old Louisiana resident Lisa Pate, but he was never indicted due to a lack of evidence. This time, prosecutors were certain they had enough to put Laverne behind bars for good. We proceeded with both cases and presented both cases to the grand jury. The grand jury heard the evidence and returned indictment and a double indictment.